Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Welcome to the last module. I guess it's the sixth module for this week. And in course of this week, I guess we have talked about a lot of new concepts about this idea of spins and magnets and these interface resistances, how they depend on these magnets and spins. And the, so the point I want to make in this last module is, I guess, some conceptual issues mainly. And for this purpose, actually, the structure we talked about in, I believe, module three is most useful. That's what I'll be using here. And that is this non-local structure where you have a magnet here and you run a current, this is just an ordinary contact. And when you run a current, you develop a spin potential in here. The way I've drawn it is the magnet points down. And so there's a lot more of the blue spins than the red ones. And so the blue potential is higher than the red potential. And as we discussed in module three, this potential extends out here, outside the current path. And of course, eventually dies out over a length of the order of a spin flip length. But for this module's discussion, I'll assume this distance is relatively short. And so the potential roughly stays the same across this length. And in principle, one could measure it here. So what one could do is you could put a magnet here. Yes, so. Just draw it as a, and let's say it's a red magnet. Which means one that points upwards. And as we discussed in module three, I believe, the potential you would measure, you know, when you look at this potential of this magnet that it floats to, the potential you'd measure would be like the polarization of the magnet times the spin potential. And for this discussion, since we're now talking about conceptual issues, let's assume that the polarization is one, which means we have a magnet that's really perfect. It only looks at red, red things and not at all at the blue things, for example. Okay, so basically what it would do then is it would just measure the spin potential, the potential associated with the red one. And basically you just get the spin potential, you know, times P and the P is basically one. Okay. Now, if we were going to plot this potential then, so the mu P, what we're trying to do is look at mu P for these different orientations of the magnet. Uh, sorry, I guess the mu P should be on the Y axis. And the x-axis is the orientation of the magnet. So if you had a red magnet, that's here, you get a relatively low potential. I guess I'll maybe I'll put the red somewhere here. Mm. If you had a red magnet, you get a low potential. That's the red. Now, if you put a blue magnet, then you would measure a high potential because then, you see, you'd be measuring these blue spins and because in electrons got injected from this blue magnet, the channel is flooded with blue spins. So that's what a blue magnet here would measure a much higher potential. So it would then measure this higher potential. Okay, so that looks simple. So the blues, blue magnet. So this is orientation of the measuring magnet. Orientation of measuring magnet. And the injecting magnet stays the same. Nothing has changed there. That's this axis, okay. So 
the blue magnet measures something relatively high up here and the red magnet measures something here. And this we have discussed before and you see as long as we are talking of just blues and reds, there is not very much to add to that. But one important, but there is a number of important issues that come in once you think of magnets that are intermediate. After all, that magnet that I am using to measure all this need not be just blue or red. It could be pointing sideways, for example. You see? And in general, you see, the whole thing is conceptually much simpler if you assume that we are only talking of one particular orientation. That is, it can be parallel, anti-parallel, but all in a particular direction which we call the Z direction. But as soon as you have non-collinear magnets, that is one magnet is this way, another was in, one is in some other direction, lot of other interesting co complications come in. And you cannot quite understand everything just in terms of reds and blues. So for example, in this case, I would say, well, what if it were pointing sideways? Well, that's like an intermediate situation here. And what you can show is actually that it goes like this. So there's a, there's a red, blue, and then there is intermediate here. And this variation, you see, is given by cosine squared half theta, where theta is the angle between the measuring magnet and the injecting magnet. So in terms of theta, just if I take this out and just label this axis as theta, this would be zero degrees and the red corresponds to 180 degrees or pi because this corresponds to anti-parallel, that's pi. Now the nearest analogy to this is the polarization of light. You see one of the things you may have learned in freshman physics is that light or photons are associated with a certain polarization. So if you have light going in a certain direction, the electric field can be, is in the transverse plane. And if it could be say, let's say light is propagating along X, then it could be in the Y direction or in the Z direction, for example. So there's the two polarizations of light. And what you could do is have a polarizer that lets light in in a certain direction and have an analyzer in another direction. And if the polarizer and the analyzer happen to be parallel, lots of light will get through. If they happen to be 90 degrees, then very little will get through. But the point is that with photons, how much gets through this combination is given by cosine squared theta. That is, zero degrees, lots of it gets through, 90 degrees, nothing gets through because cosine 90 is zero. On the other hand, when it comes to electrons, it's like cosine squared half theta. You see? If there's in the same direction, a lot of it gets through. You get a maximum. If they're 180 degrees, very little gets through. If they're 90 degrees, there's still quite a bit getting through, you see? Because 90 means you're talking cosine squared 45. You know, that's still half. So clearly, you see, it is a lot like polarization, but when we think of photon polarization, we think in terms of vectors. You represent it with vectors, whereas when it comes to electron spins, there is an entire mathematical framework that you have to get used to, and that's actually part of one of the things we do in the second part of this course, you know, when we do quantum models where you use something called spinors, which is kind of like vectors, but it's like this half this angles. You know, sometimes people say it's like the square root of a vector. But the point is it has this right mathematical framework so that you get the correct observation. And of course, I always point out that when you do all this mathematics, it's often easy to kind of give, get uh, sort of impressed by the math and forget that the math really comes is secondary in the sense that 
what comes first is the facts. These are the facts that were observed. You see, back, of course, it, these facts have been known a long time, in the sense it was in the back in the 30s and 40s, when people did experiments like this in vacuum. And that is when they actually laid out the basic facts and came up with the mathematical framework, this framework of spinors and all that to understand those facts. And today, Technology has progressed to a point that where you, where you can actually think of building devices using these facts, using this frame, using these concepts. And, and that has of course taken many years, but today we can do all that and that's the kind of thing we're now talking about. But the point I wanted to make here is always that it's the facts that come first, the math, you then find the right math to fit the facts, sort of. So when you ask, how do we know electron has two spins? The answer is again, not a long mathematical story, but because Stern and Gerlach's experiment showed two spots, the one that I referred to in the last module. Or I think it was a module before that. Now, getting back to this then, there is this interesting difference with photons, because of which you have to learn a whole new mathematical framework. You know, vectors won't quite do you have to use the spinors. Okay. Now, the next point I wanted to make here is that this kind of a curve you could observe by rotating that magnet. But the way people have done this experiment actually is that instead of rotating the magnet, often they keep a fixed magnet and just rotate the spins themselves. That is the way it works is the following that you see, you have lots of blue spins here. And they come along, and if your magnet happens to be in this direction, or maybe we'll say, draw it in the, let's say the magnet happens to be in the blue direction, then you'd say, well, lots of current would get through because cosine square half theta, and theta is zero. And if you turn the magnet, we talked about the curve you'd get. But the point here is that supposing I apply a magnetic field here in some direction. Now one of the things that's known is that when you apply a magnetic field in a particular direction and you have a magnet that is pointing in some some other direction, it wants to go around that magnetic field. Now this is something that is mathematically described by this LLG equation, the landau lifshitz gilbert equation that I briefly alluded to in the last module. And we have a homework problem that talks a little more about it, but that's not so important. This is, the basic fact is that a magnetic, if when you have a magnetic field, spins will want to precess around it. So if you had a magnetic field in this direction, it would go around, round and round this way. If you had a magnetic field, say, in this direction, then it would kind of rotate in the plane of this whiteboard. So it would kind of turn like this, if you had a magnetic field like so. So what that means is if you put a magnetic field like this, this thing will turn, and depending on how big the magnetic field is, by the time it gets here, it could well be pointing upwards. And in that case, of course, instead of getting a maxima in your current, you'd actually get a minima. And this is exactly the kind of experiments that people have done. You see, this axis, I said, was the angle between the two magnets. But one way the experiment people do is, they keep the magnets fixed, but apply a magnetic field so that you rotate the electron, rotate the electron itself, you see. So the electron came in looking blue, by the time it gets out, it's actually looking red. And then you get curves like this, actually. And this is called the Hanley effect, which has been observed again in many, many materials. In fact, it's not just with magnetic fields, but people have done these experiments with electric fields also, because there is an entire class of materials called where there is a very strong spin orbit coupling, which is actually a relativistic effect in the sense that it, it is a situation where an electric field looks like a magnetic field to the electron and makes it turn. So there are materials where, you see, you could actually 
just put an electric field here with a gate, almost like a field effect transistor. You could put an electric field here, but the electron would feel some effective magnetic field which would make it turn. And even that, there, there is now a couple of experiments which show just this effect, namely an electric field that turns the, turns the electron and then you get curves like this. In fact, that's the kind of structure that often people refer to as spin transistors. Though I should qualify it by saying that it really should be called a transistor only in the sense that one voltage can control another, but not really in the sense, in a useful sense, because to be useful you almost, you need to have things that will be able to amplify signals, and there are a whole host of other issues involved. And what has been demonstrated so far is very far from that. And one of the things we have been looking at, we have been talking a lot more about is whether Part of the problem is that whenever people talk about spin transistors, the assumption is that the signal is electrical. In other words, it's a voltage or a current that's a real signal, and the spin is some internal thing. On the other hand, if you really want to use spins, it is much more, makes more sense to have the signals be actually stored in the magnets themselves. So it is not whether a voltage is high or low, but more like whether a magnet is one way or the other, as in, as in memory devices. But that's all kind of a different subject, and we'll have to see where all that goes. That's all work in progress. The, it is hard to predict where spins and magnets will go in terms of logic devices. What is pretty clear is, in terms of memory devices, of course, they are being used. They are being used for read, reading information, probably also for writing information. All that is happening right now, actually. Whether it will get used for logic devices, that's a whole different story. So let me kind of finish up this week, like pointing out one last thing, and that was that, you see, I kind of say that an electron is like a little magnet, but the part that gets a little confusing here is the following, that, you see, if, Let's say you have electrons coming in, say the blue electrons, and you say, well, yes, if I have a magnet that's also blue, then these little magnets can get out there, can flow out into it, because there's lots of states for these little magnets to get out. And on the other hand, if it's red, then they cannot get out. Okay, kind of makes sense. But then what if this magnet is actually halfway? Then what I said is that the current will be half. Now does that mean that only half an electron will get out? Well, not really. This is where this whole quantum view of things becomes important, and that is that if you had these blue spins coming along and you had a magnet pointing that way, it is not that a half an electron will get out. If an electron gets out, it will either get out or not get out, really. But half simply means that half the times, that if you did an experiment over hundreds of electrons, half of them would get out and the other half wouldn't. And which ones would get out, that you cannot really tell. This is part of this whole quantum view of things, that this whole probability and predictability, that's at the elementary level. That for an individual electron, you cannot quite tell if it will get out or not. So just to make this a little more precise, I could say the following, that if you think of an electron as a magnet, then you might say that, well, it, it can point in any direction. It could point upwards, it could point downwards, it could point sideways. So the question you could ask is, when an electron goes from one point to another, how much information can we send? You see, because if something could be only up or down, that's like what you call one bit of information. You know, it's zero or one. Now here it looks like you can spend, send a lot of information because you could say, well, I'll just uh, have it point in all kinds of directions. Maybe, maybe intermediate directions like this. So I could have an electron, which if it is pointing this way represents some information, if it's representing this way represents some information, 
in this way some other information. So it looks like it's not just 0 and 1, but 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 8 possibilities if I just divide it up this way. But not really. The thing is if you are just one electron, when you try to measure it in any direction, you'd only get this 0 or 1. The thing is, when I'm measuring it, I have to make a choice. That is, I put a magnet, which is, let's say, in this direction. Then you see, if it gets out, I say it's red. If it doesn't get out, I say it's blue. That's it. On the other hand, if I put a magnet in this direction, and there, it happened to be red, then I guess there would be some probability it would get out, some probability it wouldn't. But you see, the point is that with one electron, once I make the measurement, there's only a finite amount of information I can get out of it. As opposed to a classical magnet with which, you know, which I could have oriented in any direction. Because the quantum view is that till you measure it, it is really not pointing in any direction. It is really just a sort of what you call this wave function. It's just has a wave function that's kind of is in this direction. But in order to know which way it's, which way it is pointing, you'd have to actually make the measurement. Now, why is it we are not worrying about that all, all that much? Well, because most of the time we are talking about steady state current flow, which means what we have been talking about is supposing I put a magnet here, how much current do I get there? And that, of course, is averaged over hundreds of electrons. So when you say that around here we have a certain number of electrons and you have a certain spin pointing in some direction, that is like averaged over millions of electrons. But of course, if you had a particular electron, then it is, uh, then it is like you should think of it more as a wave function, as this probability amplitude. And once you measure it, you can only choose to measure it in a particular direction. And depending on what direction you choose, you'll extract a certain amount of information from it. And so this is kind of this essence of what are called qubits. And this is this, this quanta, as opposed to what are called classical bits. Classical bits are like zero and one. Qubits are like almost continuous, looks like it's analog. But then once you measure it, that's when it kind of becomes a classical piece of information. Now all of this is of course, a, again, a vast subject on its own, and we can do justice to it here. What I wanted to give you was a, just this feeling that about how spins and magnets, you know, there are, it is really a very interesting topic that, you know, bridges between the quantum and the classical, that an individual spin is a quantum object, but then when lots of them line up in the same direction, what we have is a very classical object, like a magnet, you know, things that we put on our refrigerator, and which are, you know, very real things, you can measure it, you can feel it, and, and how this quantum, and as we go through these nanomagnets, you can kind of see how these quantum objects gradually become classical. No. And what is really impressive is that in the last 20 years, there's been a lot of progress in our understanding of how these two are kinds of things interact, how magnets can be used to inject spins, and how spins in turn can be used to turn magnets.